after this beautiful show, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Chris Chappell from Sheffield, UK. Chris Chappell is a well-known uh, opinion leader, expert surgeon in reconstructive urology. He's the current editor of Neurology and Eurodynamics. Um, he's a good friend, too. So he's going to present on tissue engineering uh, in reconstruction of the lower urinary tract. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much, David Monsey Sender, and the rest of the Scientific and Executive Committee. I really thank you for the great honor you've accorded me, and I don't know how I'm going to act, follow that superb act. I mean, what a fantastic demonstration of Spanish culture. I've been asked to talk on tissue engineering, and I'm going to talk from a clinical perspective, because ultimately that's what I am, a clinician. Clearly, I have a lot of conflicts of interest to mention relating to the pharma industry because pharmacology is intrinsic to the practice of functional urology. I'd like to attribute what I'm doing now and my training to my mentors, and they're many, in particular Richard Turner Warwick and Ewan Milroy. And I'll just seize upon a couple of the comments from Richard, who sends his best wishes to his many friends here. He and the other founding members of this organization, and they first brought me here 28 years ago, when I didn't dare believe I'd be doing this. They, uh, Richard really raised the, the, the comment, first of all, that the bladder is an unreliable witness. And I think we're going to hear some fantastic uh, presentations later on urodynamics, which ultimately, of course, is a subjective interpretation of objective parameters. But ultimately, as a surgeon, Richard introduced a number of new concepts in the area in refined thought. And a number, one of his comments, for instance, is that the there's no such thing as brave surgeons, just brave patients. It's something which I think still is important today when we adopt the latest new thing that comes in and then a few years later state, oh dear, it's not working so well. Because ultimately, that's as a clinician what I spend 90% of my time doing is functional reconstructive work. And it's very important, of course, to adopt the new concepts coming along and apply them to what one's doing in clinical practice. Now, of course, tissue engineering sounds very fancy, but how fancy is it? Well, firstly, the term regenerative medicine is often used synonymously with this, but it, it really is to just principally the use of stem cells. Tissue engineering really is the use of a combination of cells, engineering, materials, methods, and many other techniques using a multidisciplinary approach to try and achieve what we do clinically when we operate on patients. And that's one of the important things of this society is a multidisciplinary group with nurses, physios, urologists, basic scientists, gynecologists, all working together. And I think we should always remember that in the society. And this epitomizes that multidisciplinary approach. It's an interdisciplinary field that applies the principles of engineering and life sciences to try and change tissues to our advantage. So let's have a look at how we've achieved that in recent years. Well, let's start, of course, with a cell, which is a building block which we're all familiar with. It's the smallest unit of the organism, and it's really what identifies a living organism. So bacterium, for instance, is one of the smallest cells, whereas at the other end of the spectrum, the biggest cell probably in contemporary, uh, the contemporary world is the ostrich egg, which is unfertilized. Now, if one's talking about stem cells, clearly they can be cells which divide, which can be pluripotential, which can then divide into the 300 different tissue types that make up the human organism, or they could be mature stem cells which are on the way towards differentiation. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. Because that's where I think the greatest potential in contemporary practice lies, to take these stem cells which are mature stem cells and then differentiate them into tissues which can be helpful to us. At the end of the day, one has the disease which we all treat, and it's identification of the specific disease process which we want to work on. Having done that, one can then move along this algorithm. Take a biopsy, take cells in isolation, and then expand these cells and work through to actually produce a tissue. Within this, con within this context, we have cells, we have a scaffold, a matrix that the cells grow on, and then you have a combination of both. And clearly it's important then to identify the best way in which these cells can actually be developed and incorporated in the body, bringing in a blood supply, differentiation that's appropriate to produce a tissue substitution which can then be applied without having too much scarring, unless you want that, 
I'll come to that later, or to actually provide a reconstructive tissue. Ultimately, of course, you have to start with an idea, as you can see on the left, and then move along to, to think, consider the techniques that can be applied and then combine that to solve a clinical problem. And clearly it's important and it's beholden on us as clinicians to think through what we're going to do, to work with our scientific colleagues, and then to develop something going through different stages to make sure that it is safe and effective. And that is the principle that I'm going to apply for the rest of the talk. So let's look at where we are. There are a number of different options which are available. Let's see where we are in 2013. Well, bladder substitution, that's been a holy grail, hasn't it? You've got a dysfunctional bladder, speaking as to the ICS, it's Coles to Newcastle, because that's what we deal with, amongst other things. And so what about being able to substitute this? If one goes to the work of fights from the uh, group in Nijmegen and in the Netherlands, you can see some very interesting work with a rabbit model, looking at scaffolds with cells on, but highlighting the problem that if you take a scaffold, you could end up with encrustation. We know that happens in the bladder if you put synthetic material anywhere near the bladder, if it hangs around too long. Is that a surprise? Of course not. Nevertheless, very interesting work demonstrating the potential for ingrowth of cells into a matrix. Of course, Atala has made a major contribution in this field. He did initial work with a canine model demonstrating the same, and you can see there a control material shown in the, per in the bluish color, Purple is the experimental material, and showing that you can actually, by producing a substitute, produce something with a reasonable capacity and compliance. But then, moving into the human, the problem there, as we saw in that Lancet paper, a small series, the follow-up wasn't so good, and unfortunately, all you're doing is putting in a synthetic patch. Because, of course, it's difficult to get a blood supply, he emphasized, that's why you needed a mentum. No surprise there. That goes right back to our founding fathers using the momentum and also demonstrated that there was no innovation because how on earth do you recreate the innovation of the bladder? Because ultimately, as we know in this society and work from many people who are present and who contribute and members of the society, the innovation of the bladder is very complex and we're only just beginning to understand part of it at present. And therefore, the alligator in the swamp really is how can you produce something unless you understand what you're trying to produce. So we have a way to go here, I would suggest. Urethral substitution or reconstruction. Of course, one of the important things to me as a clinician, because that's what I spend a lot of my time doing, where you're dealing with the urethra with a stricture, which is due to ischemic spongiofibrosis, and that is ultimately the cause of a true stricture. So what you want to do is to substitute that. One of the difficult problems we have as clinicians in urology, just as in gynecology, is lichen sclerosis, unknown cause and causing significant scarring of the urethra, in the male particularly. And of course we have oral mucosa, either from the cheek, the lip or the tongue, which we can use. But if you've got a lengthy stricture, as in this case, maybe up to 17 centimeters, it becomes a surgical challenge to get enough tissue. And in particularly in the redo cases where you've already used it. So the question was, could we actually produce a tissue substitute which would be just as effective? I'll go through that and see what you think. So could we do something without harming the patient? How could we evaluate doing this? And how could we actually develop something which is an alternative treatment? Well, let's look at what was being done at that time when I got into this area. Tony Atala had done some interesting work and sent a matrix out to our colleagues in Egypt to Abdel Wahab El Kasabi, who introduced it into patients. And the initial results looked good, but there was no surprise that if there was a poor tissue bed or a lengthy stricture, it didn't work, and the long-term follow-up was disappointing. Because you just put an acellular matrix in, the cells have to grow in, have to pick up a blood supply, and you're doing this in the context of a patient with an ischemic spongiofibrotic injury. No surprise there. Moving on from that, then, there was a group over in South America who produced fantastic results, just taking a matrix put into uh, the patient and fantastic results. And to be honest, the question is how believable that was, because then Atala produced some very good work demonstrating that a matrix put in failed unless there were cells present. And that's what you'd expect based on surgical principles and also what we understand in clinical practice. Now, I went to a lecture in our institution, 
by Sheila McNeil, who's talking about skin. And she'd actually produced skin, which was for patients with significant lengthy burns. And this skin could be easily grown in the laboratory. And I thought, well, why not grow oral mucosa, wet skin? And so I approached her, and she agreed that we should proceed with this, and we secured a grant and moved forwards. You could take a biopsy under local anesthetic from the mouth, two or three millimeters, and within a few weeks produce a large uh, segment of tissue-engineered oral mucosa. To do this, you can take the cells out, disaggregate them into keratinocytes and fibroblasts, and then seed them onto a matrix, and we used a matrix from our blood transfusion service, which was from cadavers. Uh, it was antigen-free. And you could see there that you were on the right, producing a substitute rather like the native oral mucosa on the left within a couple of weeks, and get 20 to 30 centimeters of tissue from a 2 millimeter biopsy, which was then looked at by a pathologist to demonstrate that there was no histological concerns. These are mature stem cells. And we did an initial series with ethics committee approval, one patient was a failure, but all of these patients were lichen sclerosis, severe patients. A number of these three had had previous surgery, and these were all in two-stage procedures where I could put it into the penile urethra and inspect it before closure. So interesting, but too much inflammation from the matrix. So the lessons learned that we wanted to find, we could produce a tissue that was robust. We could produce a tissue which could be used, which was similar to the native oral mucosa, but we needed to get a better matrix, and we went back to the drawing board. Just after this, there's a group in Dresden that came forward with an animal matrix, which was in, then put straight into clinical practice, and in the recent, last year, I think it was, they presented some data, the AU and patients reporting the early experience, and this is then followed up by the Exxon group of Margaret Fish, who have actually looked into this in detail and reached the conclusion, which they've shared with me recently, in fact, it's not quite as good as you might expect, because firstly, it's from an animal matrix where we have limited data, and secondly, there's a problem with restenosis. So the jury's still out with us, and indeed, Guido Barbagli has had similar results, and we have to see what the longer term holds for this. So clearly, there's a way forward here, but like everything else, it does need input from a Class A laboratory, which is expensive and difficult, and maybe we need to find alternative solutions. If you then look at a follow-on from this, there's the work from Atala where they looked at humans. These were adolescent or pediatric patients putting in matrix with cells on and producing excellent results. So clearly there is a way of reconstructing the tube, the urethral tube, and I think this is something that we're going to see more about as the techniques become refined in the future. What about a urethral sphincter regeneration? As you're well aware, this has been a little bit disappointing. Bulking agents, really, they don't work very well, do they? And they're quite expensive. And that's the conclusion we've all reached. So what about bulking this with cells? You're all familiar with the work that came out of Austria and other places, and certainly the results look very exciting. But unfortunately, there have been some concerns which we are aware of. And so the jury's out on this, although there's interesting work coming from a number of centers suggesting that there is some mileage there. And the question is, not only the cells that you're producing, which proliferate, but also the fact we also often talk about periurethral injections, but we should be talking about intraurethral injections, because it needs to be an injection into the sphincter in the wall of the urethra. And to be fair, the Innsbruck group were using a very interesting uh, ultrasound technique for injecting in the wall. Last but not least, the important area that occupies many of us as urologists and urogynecologists and also nurses and physios and scientists is really the field of incontinence, stress urine incontinence, and pelvic organ prolapse. Of course, we're all familiar with the revolution that came about with the low-tension slings from Olmsten and Papa Petros. And indeed, if you look at recent data from 2010, you can see for pelvic organ prolapse in the United States, 300,000 women had surgery, 25% of them had mesh placed, and we all know what's happened there. And with stress urine incontinence, 250,000, 80% of them had a synthetic sling. And if you look at my country, you can see the increase in surgery also, which mirrors that. And the same goes across Europe. Ultimately, what we're talking about is a lack of collagen. We're all seeing the data at this meeting and other meetings, 
And for instance, as an example shown down there, you can see the loss of normally organized type 3 collagen matrix in a patient with stress urine incontinence, and it's a loss of type 1 and type 3, which is thought to be important. Now, we've been on a journey in recent years. We've seen many different materials come forward, and it's been no surprise that all of the biological substitutes don't work because they're foreign material. And so they get walled off, and there's an antigen reaction with lymphocytes, which basically eats it up, and you're left with a minimal amount of fibrosis. So that's why they don't work. But of course, autologous material does, and we know that the, the macroporous type 1 synthetic materials also are uh, tolerated by the body, although along the way in recent years we've seen other uh, materials come forward and fail, as you know. And of course we've seen the proliferation based on very limited evidence, only a few placebo, or not even placebo, but controlled studies. The, the important one, of course, is the Ward-Hilton study, which came forward, and then there have been a, a number of others that have followed, but we've seen that enormous proliferation of materials and techniques with limited evidence base because the regulatory authorities allow a grandfather clause if you're using a similar biologically compatible material to be implanted. And the rest is history, as you know. And of course, we've then seen come along the minimally invasive slings and latterly the implantation of vast amounts of material in certain situations for prolapse. And of course, the consequence of that, only in a percentage of patients, of course, but in the future we may see this increasing. And with that in mind, of course, the ICS in combination with Iuga have had to produce a very useful definition of complications because they're being seen increasingly. And of course, the regulatory authorities have come on the scene. The AUA from 2008 through 2013, increasing number of diktats coming forwards, latterly even dealing with the so-called tension-free slings and the response of the body to them. And in my country, I've been involved with Paul Hilton and Marcus Drake and uh, Tony Smith and others in leading the way with some developments. Uh, and and Charis is sitting in the front row there in terms of trying to look at the evidence base and provide information for patients. And the European Commission is now also setting up a group on this subject. This goes back to when I started in this field of urology, the Vesica technique. That was an advert that appeared at the time, and I'm afraid we're seeing the same happening now. And unfortunately, the feeding frenzy is emphasized by that bottle of wine on the right, which shows mesh. Unfortunate, but the consequence of what happens when you get use a material or something where the evidence base is limited and where you could predict that there might be problems. Ultimately, of course, mesh is very useful. Don't get me wrong. But is there an alternative? Of course, the trouble with the xenografts and allografts, as I've mentioned, is they get gobbled up by the lymphocytes. Autologous material does work, but of course there's the harvesting of the tissue and the consequences of that to the patient. But there is a, uh, it, does, it is very effective in that context. So there's no ideal material, but that's where we have uh, the materials at present. So what do we need to know if you're going to advance the field of regenerative medicine in this area? Which scaffold material is useful? Ideally, you want a scaffold which is bioabsorbable, which can be implanted, stays around with tensile strength long enough, then is absorbed, leaving behind a fibrotic reaction. Which cells? Clearly, you want to produce fibrosis. And this is a concept that came to us because one of the problems with tissue engineering is you get fibrosis. But that's what you want here. So, straightforward, you want the fibroblasts. You want to uh, consider the response of the cells on the scaffold. You want to consider biaxial forces and the dynamic processes which are present when you put cells in the body outside the laboratory. You want to consider the response of inflammation because ultimately that's going to happen, but that's what you want because that's going to generate the fibrotic response because ultimately using autologous fascia is tissue engineering, isn't it? You're taking dead fascia, putting it in, and it's going to be remodeled and engineered by the body, and the cells present are going to grow. And you want to have integration of this into the body. You want to have rapid neovascularization to bring in a blood supply to encourage the inflammatory response and the ingrowth of, of blood vessels, and you want to uh, avoid contraction. And of course, you want to have tissue remodeling, which is the ultimate principle of using a synthetic mesh, 
to produce a scar. So with this in mind, one of my co-workers, Altaf Mangera, uh, looked at the various different materials which are available as a scaffold with the other colleagues in the laboratory, who I'll mention later, and really came down to the conclusion that there are a number of components you need to look at. First thing is that they identified that SIS and polylactic acid were the two best matrices that they could find or which were available. And of course, then they looked at cellular viability and they showed that this was good with these two matrices. They looked at cell attachment and it was good with these two matrices. They looked at collagen production, also good with these matrices, better than with the other matrices. And if you looked at uh, production of elastin for the elasticity of the tissues, that was also excellent with these matrices. And if you look at tensile properties, also very acceptable. And the dotted line shown horizontally there is what we presume to be the important parameters for native tissue. So we chose polylactic acid, but why? Well, this is a, not from animal, but it's from maize. The material is easy to produce, it's FDA approved, and it can then be microspun, and it is, it is broken down in the body to lactic acid and water, so no toxic agents involved. The technique which is used is basically to produce a microspin spinning of the matrix. You can see this is, of course, rather heat Robinson because this is a laboratory, but this can be produced commercially. And you can see those are the, where the material is extruded using electrostatic forces onto a spinning disc to produce basically a sheet. And you can produce sheets of any configuration that you wish. And you can, you can see there with the sheet that you can produce the fibers of any pore diameter that you want, 75 microns, as we've seen, is pretty good with the type 1 materials. And then this is also, as we've demonstrated, very good for, for cell adherence and so on. So which cell type? Where do you get them from? Well, obviously, we were working with oral mucosa, as I've mentioned, with the urethra. But, of course, adipose derived stem cells, mature stem cells, have been looked at extensively in recent years. So we compared cell attachment. It was pretty good with both. We looked at collagen production, greater with the adipose-derived uh, stem cells. And Sabi Roman is going to be presenting some of this data later today at this meeting. And you can see here collagen um, immunofluorescence, type 1 collagen, pretty good with both of them. And, of course, extracellular matrix quality was excellent using this matrix. So this is the sort of way in which I think you need to logically develop something for the scientists who've got the expertise working with a clinician who understands the clinical problem, hopefully. This then has been implanted working with colleagues in Belgium, in Leuven, in, who have an enormous experience in this area, into a model to basically look at the initial response of the body to this, showing an acute inflammatory response at three and seven days, and, of course, this work is ongoing, so they're going to go out to three months now and see where this leaves us. And you can see at the top there the macrophages, which are stained up in brown. And if you can see some arrows on the bottom, they, those are just showing the polymorphic nuclear uh, lymph le leukocytes with, with the, the multinucleated giant cells. And shown in red there is the collagen production even at seven days. But, of course, what you want to do is to produce something with tensile strength. Now, I'm not a physicist, but obviously working with our colleagues who understand this, and there are a number of physicists present, clearly you want to have the adequate Young's modulus. And I'm told that the steeper the curve, the stiffer the material. So it's a balance. Too stiff, that's not good for the body, of course. And at the end of the day, then you have the tensile strength and the breaking force, which is at the bottom there. So you can adopt the material based on the weave of the matrix to fit in with the body. So what is the normal situation in the human? There's limited data in this area, but if you actually look at this publication from China and an extensive meta-analysis showed that this is the only one which has looked at this, you can see down at the bottom there patients with no prolapse versus prolapse giving us the parameters which we've been able to look at. And ultimately you want to produce a tissue that will of course degrade when you put it in, but will then have a maintained strength so that when the cells are present, the cells will actually be able to be viable on the matrix 
and regenerate, and that's where we've seen the normal range. But of course, if you have below the normal range, it will fail at an early stage. So that's the premise of what one's trying to achieve. So why grow tissue under dynamic conditions, dynamic loading? Well, when you're doing it in the laboratory, the problem is that the material is in a static situation. But in the body, it's going to be in a dynamic situation. So the group in the laboratory developed two models. One is to have ball bearings on a rotating disc, which is going to produce a vibration on these cells. And an even more innovative approach was to spray some of that polylactic acid onto balloon. And the jokers have put a smiling face on there, as you can see. And this is being sprayed on the matrix. And then it's put into a bioincubator, the matrix shown on the balloon. And you can see the cells stained up there in a bioincubator where the balloon is blown up and goes down over a period of time to, to allow one to investigate the way in which the cells react. And you can see shown up in blue there the viable cells, and you can see shown in green there last in production, and you can see far more in the exercised on the right than the static on the left. So you can see models that have to be adopted to try and develop something which will be useful in the clinical situation. For the future, I will just concluding now, I know I'm just on time. For the future, clearly we need to look at the pharmacotherapy component. Non-steroidals to modulate the inflammatory response, and they're working on this. Vitamin C, which strengthens matrix and collagen production, and of course is readily available. Estrogen, which we all know clinically brings in neovascularization and in vaginal tissue is useful. And ultimately, you can also change the weave of the matrix. Random fibers on the left, but much stiffer as if you have aligned fibers, and you can have a hybrid. So you can look at the tensile strength in a linear model to identify the correct matrix and then put the cells on. And for the future, certainly if you can use heparin or noid agents, you can show that they will actually produce more rapid neovascularization. But is this just pie in the sky what I'm talking about? Clearly, what do we need to know? I've gone through all of these points. Apologies rather fast, but time doesn't permit otherwise. And of course, this will be at the scientific sessions. We do recognize that you can actually produce a matrix which is acceptable. You can take adipose cells which are useful. You can produce a matrix which will allow the cells to grow and to proliferate and to produce material which could be useful in producing a scar. And you need to understand from these studies the way forward. We can harvest autologous fat very easily in the, in the, if you have a patient coming in, carry out liposuction. We're working with a group where you can do that two hours before surgery, isolate the cells, and we reckon within two or three years it'll be possible to do this as a one-stop procedure in the operating theater. It's already been used for corneal reconstruction by my co-worker, Sheila McNeil, and it's quite feasible for prolapse surgery particularly. You could actually have the matrix, the cells, put it into the body, and rather like autologous fascia, it may work. Time will tell whether that's a pipe dream, but the evidence seems to be accruing that that is feasible. Of course, I haven't done this work. I've come up with some of the thoughts on it, and I've worked with colleagues, and I'm very grateful to the various uh, charitable organizations that have funded this research, shown in the right there, including the Framework 7 project, which I have from the European community. None of this has had any industrial input, despite my disclosures. This is basic science. This is surgical practice and clinical practice. And these are the people who've done all the work. Sheila McNeil, who's head of the department, my various co-workers, these are all clinicians, these gentlemen here. Um, from around the place. Sabi, who's a fantastic young researcher who comes from this area in Barcelona on the Framework 7 Marie Curie project and other colleagues. And I can just attribute this presentation to their hard work. Thank you very much for your attention.